Well, hello everybody. Happy St. Patrick's Day. This is awesome. So we're having a little bit of fun today. Today is all about just lighthearted and just enjoying ourselves. And so, <laughs> so today I am, I guess I better adjust my mic here. It's a little bit loud. Let's see. There we go. So today I am wearing my St. Patrick's Day festivities. We've got the St. Patrick's Day overlay here. And many of you are probably wondering, what the heck is St. Patrick's Day? Well, I'm going to show you guys. So welcome to the live uh, Q&A today. It's great to have everybody here. Um, we'll wait for people to pile in. Ralph is here. It's good to see you, Ralph. And we've got uh, Raul over from India. Hello, Raul. We've got the steel cyclist. Sure, we'll bring you in too. That's all good. And it's really, really good to, uh, to see everybody here. Um, while we're waiting for people to, to pile in, Nina, good to see you, a past subscriber to the Express Entry course. Thanks for joining, Nina. And uh, <coughs> it's a funny, happy St. Patty's Day to you too. You bet. We're going to have some fun today. You know, at the end of the day, and Ann Kit likes the hat, that's good. Uh, Non-alcoholic St. Patrick's Day to you. You're right. I don't drink. So all of the Guinness and whatever else people are imbibing today, it's not something that uh, that that I do. So good point. That's awesome, you guys. And <laughs> yeah, green beer time for you guys. That's for sure. <laughs> yeah. And so here's a good question right here. Uh, Harsh says, that's one interesting hat. So now obviously this hat's a little bit goofy and everything, but and I've got my my shamrock suspenders. And you guys will see here in my overlay in the top corners, on the corner here, uh, left and right, I actually have uh, some some little uh, shamrocks and um, and those those clovers that we have are symbols of St. Patrick's Day. Marlon, happy St. Patrick's Day to you as well. It's great to have you here. And uh, I'm just gonna make a few adjustments to my desk here so I can see you guys a little bit better. There we go. Okay, I know I've got this a little bit. Uh, you can just kind of see my hat here, but I think we're back on track. Let's see who else we've got here tuning in. Ralph's got some happy faces. Uh, and Zakaria is already asking the question. I am definitely going to get to this, Zakaria. We're definitely going to be talking about this. There's no doubt about it. And uh, the, what we're going to be talking about is the express entry rounds of invitations. So hang tight. Okay. <laughs> yes, Sasha, and I look real Patrick now. Absolutely. And, uh, and uh, Tatiana, hola, hola, como esta Tatiana? It's great to have you here. All right, okay, so people are posting questions and they're asking everything that we need to do. And uh, <laughs> Shakib says, it looks like it's going well. All right, so green, yes it is so green. So let me explain to you guys why it's so green. And I'm just gonna adjust my, I've got a little thing to help adjust my, focus on my camera a bit here. Okay, I'm going to show you guys why it is so, why it's so green today. All right, so I'm going to flip my screen around. And I don't know if any of you guys are having trouble with your, um, if you're having any trouble with your Chrome browsers, but mine has just been crazy. Like, I do not know what the heck's going on with my Chrome browser. So let's flip over here and we'll just try to use this one. I've got ads on here and stuff like that, but whatever. You guys get the picture. So this is just St. Patrick's Day in Canada. This is obviously an Irish holiday. You can see I'm, I'm blue now because uh, my, uh, my screen here is, um, I don't think I can adjust it. Let's see. Oh, yeah, I can. There we go. I had to turn off my, my, my green screen <laughs> on that image because the green screen thinks that this is, uh, uh, thinks that this is supposed to be a, a, a funky little color. So anyways, I digress. So here we go, St. Patrick's Day. So this day is actually only celebrated officially in Newfoundland and Labrador um, on the, the nearest Monday to March 17th. So technically it would have been celebrated on the 15th. Um, and it basically it's, it's celebrated in remembrance of St. Patrick, who was a missionary who converted many, Ireland's, many of Ireland's inhabitants to Christianity way back in the fifth century. And uh, his feast day also celebrates Irish culture. So basically, this day, St. Patrick's Day, is the day that allegedly he, he died, I guess, March the 17th. But it is carried on, and it has been brought to Canada. 
And there are some big parades before the coronavirus. There were some big parades that they did. So like in Toronto and Montreal, large scale St. Patrick's Day parades are held often on the Sunday closest to March 17th. And the parade in Montreal has been held every year since 1824. Now, obviously, the pandemic and everything has thrown a loop in all of these plans. But um, but essentially, it was is first recorded uh, as a celebration in 1759 by Irish soldiers serving with the British Army. So that's where it got started here in Canada, which was then called New France. So before Canada was even created. So there's a little bit of history for you now. A couple other things I want to, <coughs> excuse me, I want to, I want to let you know. So, like I said, that it, basically this Saint Patrick here, this day that we're celebrating, he was born in 387 A.D. So somewhere around there, around Scotland and England, and the the basic story is that he returned to Ireland, like I said, as a missionary. And he's said to have played an important role in converting the inhabitants of Ireland to Christianity. And my favorite part, ridding the island of snakes. <laughs> However, there's no evidence that there's been any snakes in Ireland in the past 10,000 years. So the snakes he drove out of Ireland may represent particular groups of pagans and druids at the time. So it's quite a historical thing. And then they believe that he died March 17th. But they're not sure 461 or 493. Well, that's quite a large gap. But regardless, that's why we have March 17th. And then some of the symbols, which you can see I'm wearing right here. Some of the symbols is uh, is the color green right here, sometimes orange, and the shamrock, which if you go to my main screen here, that's these little leafy things. And if I flip my screen back, I'll just show you again uh, on uh, if we just flip back to, yeah, so right here, and then I'll shift over to the shamrock. So that's the shamrock right there. And obviously that makes sense why we've got the shamrocks here. So we've got anything green. And here's the interesting thing. There's also a little bit of a tradition here in Canada that, um, although it's kind of a strange one, at least we, we, would, we would do this to each other in school. If you didn't wear green on St. Patrick's Day, then your buddy could come up and pinch you. <laughs> so I don't know if that's necessarily practiced anymore. But 40 years ago when I was in school, my goodness, that is insane. 40 years, 40 years ago, that was one of the traditions if you weren't wearing green. And so we'd always say, oh, my sock is green or, oh, I've got green on my underwear. I just can't show you <laughs> so, so that someone couldn't go up. So you'd always wear green on St. Patrick's Day. So that's what we're doing today. Why not have a little bit of fun? I'll be honest, this channel was getting kind of stuffy and the, the topics were so meaty and everything. And Yes, immigration is super serious, but why not have some fun, right? Why not? Now, why St. Patrick's Day means so much to me, I'm not done showing you guys stuff. We're going to flip back here to the village of Carmangay. This is where I grew up. This is my hometown. And the main hotel in Carmangay was owned by none other than Mr. O'Connor, which, well... O'Connor is more of an Irish name than I think you can ever get. And of course, he was kind of the pillar of the community. He was, uh, he, he ran the hotel, you know, and, um, and so that Carmen Gay Hotel owned by Mr. O'Connor, um, because of that emphasis, I guess I should say, that emphasis on St. Patrick's Day that he, you know, he played in the community, they decided to do a parade just like everywhere else. So although this pandemic has kind of shut things down, um, people now start to gather all over to my little, little tiny village where I grew up in, which is like 250 people. Um, <laughs> this little community here has their, sh they call it the, the shortest parade in the world. <laughs> it's like, it's like they walk down the street essentially with their green hats on and and everything celebrating uh, the St. Patrick's Day. And so that's why it means a lot to me because that right there, that image of the village of Carmangay, um, that was my hometown. And, and so it was a, a big celebration. Now, I didn't really pick into full gear until I had, uh, I had moved away to school, but that's my roots. So I just wanted to share that with all of you and uh, just bringing in on a little bit of Canadian culture so that if you're wondering what the heck is this St. Patrick's Day, that's what it's all about. So, and you can see, we are a multicultural country. And we have 
communities and people that bring their traditions, all the good, wonderful things that they have, they bring them here to Canada. And that's what makes us multicultural. And we celebrate everybody's important dates and occasions. And, and we, uh, we value everyone's traditions that you bring from your country. So today, it's all about... <laughs> it's all about St. Patrick's Day. Okay, let's jump back and let's just see. Well, what I'll do is I'll just remove this overlay because I can see it could probably get kind of distracting after a while. But I'm going to leave the hat on because it's St. Patrick's Day and I'm, I feel St. Patrick-y. In fact, I think I'm going to wear it when I have my, I've got a, um, a special series that I do for uh, young immigration lawyers called Coffee in the Times of COVID. And uh, this little series of sessions today, there's another one that falls right at noon today. So we're definitely going to cover off on that. All right. Okay. Let's get back here and let's, let's talk about a few things. Let's see what people want to learn about, what people want to hear about today. So let's see. Um, okay. Muhammad is asking this big, massive question here. <laughs> Muhammad, my friend, you've got to do your research. I'm not doing it for you. You've got to go to the immigration website and do your, your own research. He's asking for information about everything. I'm going to ring the bell there, Muhammad. And when, when, when I ring that bell right there, that's where I point you over here. And if you want me to evaluate your, your options for immigrating to Canada, go over, click on the link below, book a consult, and we can go through it. But this channel is not designed to help you figure out what options are available for you. Okay. <laughs> Share hype. Don't know what that is. Okay. Okay. Ankit says, sorry to say, but you need better marketing than word of mouth. Far less experienced people have more followers. I found you too late myself. Post my AOR in December, 2019. Ankit, you bet. Yep. My marketing has always been just provide helpful, you know, information and then people will find me. And for sure I have to do a better job. And for sure those channels are a lot bigger and that's fine. So guess how I get people to see what I'm doing here, Ankit? It is by people sharing. Share, share. And yes, I'm experimenting with a few things to, to start marketing and let people know about this. For sure, we're going to start doing that. But I'm just an immigration lawyer. Like, I'm not some slick marketing person who knows how to do all these fancy things. Although I'm slowly figuring out a few things, like how to put Happy St. Patrick's Day overlays on my, on my camera. But you're right. And Kit, I wish that I had, um, you know, uh, a full team of marketing people. So I have someone who's assisting right now and we've been experimenting with a few things. But at this stage, it's all about the content and you guys liking and sharing and telling your friends. So if you can do that, that would be awesome. Okay, Sayema says, is Canada currently accepting student visas? Yep, they are. Are you able to travel? Well, that depends. And once again... Do you qualify? Are you eligible? Book a consult. Flip over here with us, and you can you can book the consult with one of our lawyers, and um, and that will take you. The link is right below, and we can dive in a little bit deeper, Sayama. But the borders are not closed to all students. There are ways of coming through. Okay. All right, Mercio says. Okay, I applied for a PR uh, based. ONP, August 2018. I called Webform, asked MP intervention. This you have to wait. Nothing's required for me, but no answer. How can I get an answer from IRCC? Same thing, Mauricio. Book a consult. We can look into it. All right, flipping through because I don't want anyone to get their questions. I'm going to try to hit as many questions as I can today. After all, it is, it's St. Patrick's Day. It's the spirit of giving and cheer and goodness. <laughs> Okay, hope you're doing good. Is it possible to apply for express entry alone if your spouse is with you in Canada? That is going to be extremely difficult. Is it possible? Well, I guess if you have some kind of a justification, but I can tell you, uh, Shoab, um, immigration, I've seen on many occasions, they've said, well, we just don't believe it. We don't think you've actually, you're genuine in your application and we don't believe that your spouse is truly not going to accompany you because they're already here. How do you justify it? The only times where I've ever had any success, well, I've never done it myself, but counseled people, is if the spouse is actually not going to be staying. And the spouse has maybe an ill ill parents like that are sick and need their care and they have to return back just because of the timing. 
And so one spouse goes ahead with the application. The other is actually leaving the country and going back to the home country to care for maybe some elderly parents or there's something else that's pulled them away. But you better have a very good justification. Anyone who's telling you that it's not a problem, don't believe them. They don't know what they're talking about. All right, Jari says, uh, okay, got ITA last week. I'm gonna give you one of these. Woo, awesome. Oh, my med expires in six months. What will happen if the treatment of my application lasts more than six months? Well, as long as your medical is valid when they do the completeness check, so as long as it hasn't expired by that time, by you filing your EAPR and then completing the completeness check, you are fine. If you're in Canada, they, in many cases, if you're inside Canada, they are waiving, um, excuse me, the extension of those medicals. But if you're outside of Canada, I can tell you that often if it takes a long time and your medicals have expired, then they will ask you to get new ones. All right, let's see here. Next question. Okay. <laughs> PEQ rules are changed. Sorry, Allure Sexy. Rahul, that's just hilarious. Uh, maybe that's you on the cover of Allure. Hey, that'd be great, Rahul. <laughs> okay. PEQ rules are changed uh, by when Montreal will be open for jobs at LMIA and will it be easy to get PR in Quebec after having work print? Please do tell me. If you do not speak French, okay? If you do not speak French, you are always going to have a hard time immigrating to Quebec. You have to go through the Quebec-based programs. Absolutely, the rules have changed, and there are, um, you know, there, there. It because of those rule changes that just occurred in Quebec, it is opening things up a little bit. But understand, if you don't speak French, you are going to have a hard time uh, because the current government in Quebec just is really anti anyone who doesn't speak French. So keep that in context, Raoul. All right, Elena likes the outfit. Thank you, Elena. Okay, joining in from Dubai. Awesome, welcome, Amit. It's great to have you. Okay, when will FSW all program draw happen? I knew it was coming. It is now officially time. All right, let's take a look here. We are going to shift back and people are gonna see, if you have not seen already, that we have a round of invitations that was issued Today, and if we scroll down, and maybe I can enlarge this for you guys so you can see it a little bit better on my screen, but this you will see right now, round 178. So 176 was the big massive draw for CECs. And then we have had not one, but two, if I can get in there, two draws since then, both provincial nominee. This one, number of invitations, only 183. Why? Because there just are not that many PNP nominations with people going through, you know, that, that had their profile in the pool. And you can see here that the score of the lowest ranked candidate was 682. What does that mean? That person basically had 82 comprehensive ranking system points, 82. CEC scooped out everybody all the way down to 75. That PNP scooped out someone that had 82 basic human capital points in the profile before they had the 600 added on. So um, they said the tiebreaker, March 4th at 1656. I'm almost positive that everybody that had a score of 682 was drawn. There was probably only one, right? And so you can see here that this PNP draw happened. So let's go back. We'll dive in because this is what you guys love to see. Let's dive in and take a look. So you can see now 176 came, Canadian experience class, big draw. Then we've had two PNPs. So the big question, if we go back here and you look, before February the 13th, on February the 10th, there was a PNP draw and then there was a CEC. And before that, earlier in January, we started with a PNP the next day right here. Then the next day, January the 7th, there was a CEC. Then the 20th, there was a PNP. Then the 21st, there was a CEC. Then we went to February the 10th, PNP. February the 13th was the big massive draw. And now we've had a PNP, but no CEC after March the 8th. So now the question of all questions is, one, are they going to do tomorrow a CEC draw? You know what? 
I'm going to go out on a limb and I'm going to say yes. I'm going to say they are going to do another another CEC draw. Now, there is going to be so many people, you guys, that have their profiles in the pool now that have all been piling in since that February 13th draw over one month ago. There's going to be so many people that have piled in in the last month that I don't think they're going to do a big, massive scoop. In fact, I'm guessing if they were to do a CEC, that it would probably probably be more around the range of 350 if they were doing it tomorrow. And because I can say whatever I want, I'm going to take the plunge and say tomorrow they're going to do a CEC draw and it's going to be right around 350. Complete speculation, complete, right? If we go back here again, and you can see with these past draws, I'm going to back up in my browser and I'm going to flip my screen over so you guys can see it. Let's go down and take a peek at who is actually in the pool. So remember, so many of these candidates are FSWs, but there's a ton of CECs that were also, also pulled out. So if we go down here, there in fact are from 350 right here all the way down, there is over 30,000 people that are total in that range under or below 350, 350 or lower. The vast majority of these are FSW candidates, but there are many, many that are CECs that have all piled in in the last month. Remember, everything was scooped out. Now, anyone below 75, technically, I guess it's 67 points you could have and still meet the minimum uh, CEC. But in this situation, if you look at how many people are there, from 401, well, 351 to 400, there's 50,000. From 400 to 450, there's 43,000. So you guys can see how many people are in the queue. And a lot of these, like I said, are FSW candidates. This encompasses everybody that's in the pool. So I'm going to go out on a limb and I'm going to say on March the 18th, I don't know what time, <laughs> maybe the same time, at 11 UTC, I'm going to say number of invitations issued, I don't know, I, uh, 7,000, we'll say. We'll say 7,000 invitations. I'm going to say that the CRS score <laughs> that they needed, I'm going to go out on a limb and I'm going to say that the CRS score, the minimum one is right around 350. So there you go. That's my prediction. I have no basis upon which to make that other than pure speculation, but Hey, that's, what's fun. And it's St. Patrick's day. So I can divine and guess and prognosticate all I want. It doesn't matter. Because at the end of the day, immigration, they're going to do what they're going to do, right? Okay, <laughs> so there you go, guys. There you go. Let's dive into some more questions. <laughs> okay, okay, Shakib. Yep, looking good, sounding good. Thank you. Okay, anyone who asks about is there, I'll put up Go Green again. Anyone who asks about whether or not um, there's going to be another round or anything, I'm, I've answered that question, so I'm going to skip through all of those, you guys. Okay, let's expand this one so people can see it a little bit better. And I'm just going to keep them down here so I've got a better big screen here. Okay, zooming on. Um, okay, Abishak, hey, thank you. Happy St. Patrick's Day to you as well. <laughs> now, the Guinness I'll leave to you, my friends. I'm not an alcohol drinker. I don't drink at all. But I will definitely have maybe a green hot chocolate or something. <laughs> That's what I'll do. Or I'll have a green herbal tea. That's what I'll do. All right. <laughs> okay. All right. Thank you, Tolu. I appreciate that. My hat is a little bit big, so I can maybe kind of, do you know what? I could kind of put it at an angle maybe. That would be, that's more, that's more like it, right? Let's have some fun. Um, okay. This person, you're not reading my comments. That's because your comment was crazy. All right. <laughs> okay. No FSW program. I've already explained that one. Love the Irish pride, you bet. Um, there is no booze. I'll leave that up to you, Christian. You guys can booze it up. I'm not a boozer. And I guess that's why I'm just about turning 50. And I don't, I think, I don't know, how old do I look? I don't think I feel like, I don't think I look like I'm 50, but that's why I don't drink and smoke and, and I try to eat right. So, all right, let's try, let's switch the angle here. There we go. Nice. There's a good Irish an a good Irish hat there. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right. What's the real problem? Uh, 
Okay, I don't know what David's asking here. What is the real problem with FSW? Because being PNP or CEC does not necessarily mean being inside Canada now. It mean, it's because, David, there are... Um, when You can even be in Canada technically and, and get an FSW, but the vast majority of people qualifying through the FSW or PNP even, well, lots are inside Canada with the PNP, but the vast majority of FSW are outside Canada, David. Simple as that. Okay. Okay. Uh, next CC drop, but I put you on here, Tossif, because you said happy St. Patrick's Day. <laughs> okay. Um, all right. Sayama, how much time will it take a student who came in 2019 to get his PR? Oh my goodness. That varies. There are so many different factors. That's not even something that I can answer. Okay. Igor says tomorrow marks one year from the closure of the borders in Canada. Time flies. You're right, Igor. Thank you for pointing that out, my friend. That's exactly correct. Can you believe that? One whole year since the borders have been closed. Crazy, crazy. Okay, here's a great question. Crudy says, hey, can you please tell me for how long we need to maintain our settlement funds in our account before the ITA? What if I take it from my father? Do I need to maintain the gift money even before I receive the ITA? One thing I want to show you guys. Okay, this question right here, this is one of the questions that I get more often than not related to settlement funds. There is no specific timeline that you have to have the money in your account. Now, I'm going to shift over here, and I want to show you guys this. I'm going to shift over to my website. I'm going to type in Canadian, oh, I never used this one, CanadianImmigrationInstitute.com. When you go here and when you uh, subscribe, oh, my goodness, seriously, I, I guess I don't have anything saved here. I can't even jump in. When you subscribe to my Express Entry Step-by-Step -step course in here, click on the link below, I have got an awesome group, a small little group that I'm working through right now, and we're gonna keep it closed for a little bit. But my Express Entry 2021 Complete Step-by-Step -step Guide, I cover all of those things, all of them. They're all discussed in here. And you can watch this video, click on the link below, and then register to get notified when it, the course opens up again, okay? So go there, do that now, and register. And I will let you know when it's gonna open up again. I haven't decided. Um, we did three back to back to back really quick and I'm going to hold off now for a while because I'm focusing on the spousal course. Um, but this is where you go and this course is chock full of everything that you could possibly need, including answering this question right here about how long you have to keep the funds in. So if you're getting a gift deed from a parent, you don't need to have the funds in your account for any period of time. Immigration indicates that your letter from the bank is supposed to indicate how long your average, well, the average balance over the past six months. That's where every, all this confusion all over the world is with people feeling like they have to have the full amount for six months. Now, if you do have that full amount and it's in your account for six months, that's great, wonderful. But if you are slowly saving and accumulating your funds over a six month period or longer, and immigration can see that your income is, is being slowly deposited into your account, that's great too. They know it's yours. They know that you haven't just gotten some loan from somebody, right? Family give money, friends loan money. At least I don't have too many friends and I've got some good friends that would just give me $12,960 Canadian and not expect it to be repaid back. So that's kind of where we're going with that one. All right, cruising on here. This person says, why can people come in from the U.S. with their copers? Even when the U.S. is a hotspot, it's political, my friend. It's politics. It's flat out, that's why. It is politics. The U.S. is one of our major food suppliers to Canada. One of our major. And so, one of our, it is, a, 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 it is our largest trading partner. So, that is why the borders, notwithstanding the, the, you know, the highest rates of COVID being in the U.S., that's why. Politics, politics, politics. I don't have any other answer other than that. All right, Julia, good morning to you. Thanks for connecting in. Okay, and we're going to keep moving down here. <laughs> and um, you're very welcome, Sayama. Thank you. 
And we've got lovely here. Great. Okay. Okay, Marlin says, is a bridging work permit apply also to family member who are already here in Canada or just to the main applicant? It applies if your bridging work permit is for a skilled work. You have to show if you're on any kind of an open work permit that you're working in a skilled occupation. If you don't, just like your postgrad work permit, if you're on one of those, you have to show that you're working in a skilled occupation as a principal applicant, skill level um, B, A, or O. And if, if you are, and it's at least six months, that your, uh, that your work permit is being issued for, then that spouse can get it. And same thing goes for bridging. Good question. All right. Um. <laughs> Abhishek says, it's been a month since I received and paid the right of permanent residence fee. What do you think the holdup is? The holdup is called coronavirus, COVID-19. <laughs> That's what the holdup is. And many of those uh, locations where they're issuing... Um, you know, uh, where they're finalizing these applications, um, there's just limitations with, with what officers can do. So I can't speak to that, Amishek. All right. <laughs> okay, the Steel Cyclist has been watching the channel for one year now. I'm going to give you one of these. Woo, awesome. Okay, FSWEE, February 2020, AOR, all documents in, no progress since. Don't you think RC should give us some info about timelines? they cannot give you info about timelines because IRCC is not making the decisions to close the border. It's public health and Justin Trudeau, okay? So if you guys want to blame someone for the borders being closed, then point to the wonderful Prime Minister of Canada, Justin Trudeau, and Public Health Canada. That is the two bodies that are making these decisions, okay? You watch who's announcing what's happening with the, you know, opening of borders or the new orders in council. It's our Prime Minister Trudeau. So if you guys want to talk to someone about being stuck outside, it's not IRCC's fault. This is entirely, this is entirely uh, public health. All right, and those orders in council. There we go. But, but my friend, I feel for you. There are so many people like you all over the world that are stuck in this situation where you've been counting on coming to Canada. And February 2020, that was right before the borders closed. So I feel for you, my friend. I really, really do. And so don't take my cavalier responses as any indication of, of the, the a lack of compassion that I have for you guys, because I truly, truly feel for you. And I wish the borders would open myself. All right. Okay. Uh, EC says, if I were to extend my bridging work permit, can I do it online or paper-based? Online. I'd always do extensions online. The officer I talked to via hotline said it has to be paper-based since the system will not recognize it. Okay. Um, that's a good question. Understand that hotline is cray-cray. Um, that is really, really unusual. I'm not quite sure. Um, an officer on the hotline said it has to be paper-based since the system will not recognize it. Well, I can't speak to that. I'll be honest, EC. This is one that I'm gonna ring the triangle because there are a whole bunch of different factors here that we gotta look at. And so can you extend a bridging open work permit through an online filing? That's the question. Well, I'm gonna ring the bell on that one because I need to go back. I've never actually had to do that for a client. Um, I don't think ever. We always had the permanent residence. So we're, we're in new territory now. So if that's some internal policy guidance at this and the hotline is basically the call center. And remember, they're no different. These call center people, they've hired a ton of new people and they're no different than your, your Dell computer uh, hotline people or your um, any, any company who has a call center overseas. <laughs> that, that's, they're no different. They're the same. So the lack, you know, the lack of training and everything, they're definitely, you cannot trust everything that you hear from the, from the call center, disappointingly. Okay. Hope you will. Do you think study permits for master students will decrease too? Saw it on your talk the other day. Thanks. Um, study permits for master students will decrease. Well, I think ultimately just comes down to your education plan, right? And what uh, Tre uh, Tria Post is talking about here, I'm going to go back here and I'm going to go to YouTube. And I'm not sure the easiest way to pull this up, but I am going to go to the Canadian Immigration institute 
I'm going to pull this up here, Canadian Immigration Institute. Okay, here it is. So I'm going to flip my screen over. And what we're talking about here is I have a number of different playlists here. So this is the live one. That's a nice still shot there. So playlist here, if you scroll down, you will see that there is one called Immigration Nation. So if you view the full playlist, the last one that I did on Immigration Nation, um, let's just see here if these are how these are organized. <laughs> oh, do you know what? I don't think we haven't tagged it in here yet. Okay, that's why. All right, this is something we got to get on. If we go to the videos here, you will see that I did a video and uh, let's see, here's our lives and it's not letting me search. My goodness, why is this so difficult? Okay, well, I did a video right, oh, that's right here. International students, it's got about 1,200 views right now. This one, international students, a challenging calm. This one, you've got to go and watch if you're an international student, you absolutely have to. This one with Will Tao was awesome. We actually need to do a better uh, a better thumbnail for it. This one I don't I don't really like. Igor, if you're watching, let's do a different thumbnail for this video because it's not very easy to read at all. Okay, jumping back. <laughs> Igor is my go-to man here. He is awesome. Okay, so there we go. So yeah, ultimately it depends upon your education plan. All right. Um, Okay, Andre says, hey, Mark, what are the odds of receiving an LOI from Alberta? I'm an FSW, IT NOC, CRS 325, great Portuguese, by the way. Obrigado, Andre. Muito, muito obrigado. Um, <laughs> the, uh, the reality is um, Alberta is still waiting to see what IRCC is going to do. So if IRCC does another CEC draw tomorrow that scoops everyone out of the pool, then provinces are going to have to look outside. So they are going to have to extend notifications of interest to people outside if they have any hope of meeting their quotas. So 60, you know, over 6,000 uh, provinces have, you know, up to 6,500, sometimes a little bit more, sometimes a little bit less than that. But that's the allocation that they get each province. Remember, there's over 80,000 um, of the immigrants that come through Canada under the economic classes 80,000, over 80,000 are allocated to the provincial nominee programs. There's over 108,000 allocated to the FSW, the CEC, the federal skilled trade. So you have to take all of this and factor it in and realize that they've got to do more rounds of invitations. This 27,332 that they did right here on February the 13th, this massive biggest draw ever February the 13th, you can see here, 75 lowest CRS, 27,332. That one right there, you guys. That's not going to be enough, even with these PNP draws. So, yeah, let's see. Maybe, maybe tomorrow. Okay. All right, let's keep going through here. So, thank you, Andre, for your question. All right. Uh, good evening to you, Divine. Okay, and outside, I'll just answer this one too because lots of you are asking the same question. Outside of Canada, you have to realize, you guys, that, um, oh boy, outside of Canada, until the borders are lifted, the border restrictions, there's just, it's just not going to move forward. Okay, it's just not. All right? Okay, I'm going to change my hat a little bit here. Okay, moving on. Um, Yeah, I think Sean answered that one already. <laughs> Another one next CEC draw. And no, Amit, there's no real way because an officer makes a decision at that time whether or not they're going to extend um, the, the medical. So they will, they, you, the, the earliest that you're going to get that notification is when an officer says, hey, you need to go get a new one. Or you just don't hear from them in Canada and they just issue your magical little email that says congratulations you're a permanent resident or they send you an email <clears throat> to register through the landing pilot okay um okay McC uh mccann says uh do we need to scan stamps and valid visa from canceled passport for eapr nope you do not okay hello deep good to see you hala shout out to you okay and Divine, happy St. Patrick's Day to you as well. All right, keep zipping through here.
Okay, Elena says, I'm bilingual. Express Entry says to set the language test I scored higher in as my primary language. Will my application be rejected? No, it won't at all, Elena, it won't. They just will factor it in. Remember, when it comes to your language scores, your primary has more weight given to it than your secondary. So if you've set it, say, as English as your primary, but your French is better, well, it's just going to impact on how they calculate the score. So they give more weighting, more points to the primary versus the secondary. Although if French is, if your French is high, you know, that's also going to add in those extra up to 40, uh, up to 50 points, 30 or 50 points for French language ability when you, when you speak both languages. Okay. Uh, Key says, is the break between your express entry courses, is there any way to purchase access to the course videos? There isn't. So I am not, I, at this stage, I'm not selling access to the course, just standalone access. It's always through the master class. And so the cart isn't open right now. It's closed as I've, as I've showed you guys. So at this stage, the only thing that you can do <clears throat> is to go in. And once I have a sufficient number of people that have expressed a desire to take the course, then I'll open it up. So if you're truly interested, what you have to do is go here to the Canadian Immigration Institute. The link is right below in the description and click on here to get notified when the registration opens. So leave me your name, email address, your phone number, and I will find whatever means necessary to notify you that the ITA has been granted. Okay, so that's how you do it. And yes, I used to I used to sell it as a standalone, but the course is just so much so much better now, so much more comprehensive. And with me leading you through it, teaching you, guiding you, it's worth every penny of the three hundred and forty seven dollars that I charge. Remember, I used to sell it for four hundred ninety seven just the course materials itself. And I didn't even have all of those other amazing document section in module six, but you can go here, go to the site, watch the video and you'll get a little sneak peek into, um, into what's, what's actually contained in there. All right. So leave your email key and, uh, and then I will notify you when, if there's enough people, like if, if there's a hundred people that connect in and express an interest, then I'll open the card up again. But at this stage, I need to focus on making sure that there's a large enough group to justify having the course and teaching it. Um, but at this stage, I'm kind of holding off on selling the course. Okay. Um, let's see here. <laughs> Eric, thank you. Such a festive outfit. You bet. And we're having some fun today. Okay, uh, Miss says, if some of the pages was unclear or pixelated due to compression of the PDF, should we resubmit those documents through a web form? Well, if you can, sure, go ahead. If it's not legible, right? This is something that I go through all the time is, is um, this reality of having um, so much, uh, like so much that they expect of you to upload. It's just a reality, but there's only so much space, four megabytes per spot. Sometimes I'll be creative, and if I can't fit it in, I should probably do a video on this one. I probably should. So sometimes I will be creative, and if I have a whole bunch of bank statements and things like that, sometimes I will break them up into pieces, and then I will stick them in other boxes. Maybe I'll stuff it in with the passport. Maybe I'll stuff it in with the letter of explanation section. Maybe I'll put it somewhere else where I've got more room with the medical. And then I say, please know that here is the start of the... Of the um, of the documents for my proof of funds, but this is just part one of four. Part two is contained in, in the passport, uh, bundled with the passport. Part three is bundled with whatever, the e-medical. And part four is in the letter of explanation. And so sometimes if I've had to do that because the, the you know everything is so pixelated, but who's talking about that strategy? Nobody's, see, you hear it here first. These are the things that I teach my clients. These are the strategies that I use. These are the things that nobody's talking about out there except me. All right, you you do what you have to do. Okay. All right, so need assistance for a senior professional. Ring the bell, tell you to flip over here to Holthy Immigration Law. Oh, I don't even think I have it. Oh, there it is right there. Go to the site, click on book a consult, and we can chat about what the options are available for you, uh, Victoria. When it comes to senior professionals, I'm assuming you mean older, more experienced. Guys, it's going to be tough. This game now is a young, young person's game. 
If you're outside of Canada and you don't have a connection with Canada, it is becoming increasingly difficult to find a pathway forward. Immigration, as you would have watched in the video with, that I did with Will Tao, like we have a very, very low acceptance rate right now. It used to be really, really high, but in many countries, 40% is, is very common. You know, rejection, rejection rates um, of, of up to 75% are higher in some countries. And so understand that's one of the, the pathways that every, every person out there with a YouTube channel is peddling. Get your study permit. And all the education agents are also trying to exploit you guys. Get your, get your study. Go into school and apply for a study permit. And if you come to Canada, then you can apply for permanent residence. Well, I'm not faulting it. Like, yes, if you're overaged, if you can find a way to get a study permit, absolutely. Come, do your master's, whatever it is, your upper level. And as long as it's not at the same level or lower, Get some education, study in Canada, transition to a postgrad work permit, and then your points, you have ability to score points for Canadian education, Canadian work experience, and qualify through the CEC, which has a lower threshold. And as we just saw, crazy things happen when you're in Canada. So there you go. Okay, and everybody is duplicating their questions. That's always nice. <laughs> Don't duplicate your question. Okay. All right, Anbu says, uh, nice hat, thank you. The last 10 years of work experience must be before the ITA date. My starting work experience is from May 2012 to May 2013. I'm gonna ring the bell, Anbu. The reality is on the day you receive your ITA, that's when it locks in. So you go back 10 years from the date you receive your ITA. Any work experience that's older than that isn't included. Simple as that. All right. Okay. Uh, yep. Okay. We talked about that. So miss, I, that was a double question, man. You guys, <laughs> you guys are posting your questions twice. It makes it super, super challenging for me here. Uh, let's see what else we have going. You guys. Okay, we got a big one. Okay, this one right here, I'll just point out a Tanzeel here. You've got a big question that relates to you. I'm gonna ring the bell and tell you to book a consult. Um, <laughs> you're welcome, Shoab. My, my, it's my pleasure to help. Okay, yes, PNP draw today, Arsh. Okay, so this one right here, Eric, I'm gonna ring this bell. Your friend needs to book a consult for me to determine whether or not he, he has any possibilities. Um, yeah, how can he prove his, his at least one year of skilled work experience? That is so case specific. It's not something that I can talk about really in a live Q&A like this. He needs to book a consult and, uh, and then we'll connect with him. Okay, actually, do you know what? I will show you one thing just because I always want to try to be as helpful as possible. So if we go here and we go to the express entry completeness check, I'll flip the screen over and we're going to wrap up tight right here at 11 because I have um, another consultation with another client. So we're going to wrap this up. But if you go here and you go to work history, proof of work experience right here and you scroll down, we'll get rid of that annoying part and you scroll down, you'll see here that there is a section for what to do if you are self-employed. Articles of incorporation, other evidence of business ownership, have you earned income, documentation from third-party individuals indicating the service provided. That's like clients or customers who can say, yep, I did, uh, you know, I paid them to do work for me. Uh, payment details, you know, banking records, all those kinds of things. But he can't just put in their own, his own self-declared um, affidavit that says, hey, yep, this is my duties. This is what I did. No issues at all. Uh, they don't like that very much. All right, just about wrapped up for today. It's been a really, really good one. Uh, let's see here. We're gonna zip through. We're just gonna grab a couple really, really quick ones. Um, okay, yeah, Max, the progress bar is a complete waste of time. It means nothing other than it's been six months from the date you submitted your application. So you can ignore that progress bar. It means absolutely zero <laughs> other than six months from the date that you submitted your application. But hey, it was a good trick by IRCC because they, they stopped people from calling every two seconds when the application was under six months. 
Okay. Yep. Okay. Kashik, I'll answer this one and this will be the last question because it's a good one. So he says, thank you. He says, why do you new inland um, or newer inland applicants being approved over older ones uh, that are in the backlog? Why, why, why do I understand? I'll tell you exactly why. Because the new ones are coming in. When they come in, they've hired a third party organization to scan them immediately once they come in to get into the electronic system, a copy of the application, which are then disseminated out to the officers. The old ones that were all stacked up via paper, via paper, the old ones that were stacked up via paper are, um, are slowly being scanned in. They're going through these boxes and stacks and piles of them. And that's why it's taking longer. Kaushik, if you have an application through Express Entry and you're seeing people that are getting processed faster than you and you're in Canada CEC and you are, um, and it's an Express Entry application, then I can tell you there is no rhyme or reason to that. Sometimes people get their applications approved quicker because an officer doesn't have to check into as many things. And that if there's questions or delays or, or issues that they're wondering about, that can delay the processing of an application. That's why one goes faster than another. Maybe you have dependents. Maybe you have a spouse that also needs to be reviewed. And the single applicants go through faster through CEC than, than, uh, than married couples. So that's really where it comes down to. All right? Okay, I'm going to turn this one on right here. And that is our symbol, our music, our sound. So I'm going to turn it down because it's pretty loud. That's the signal that we are getting ready to wrap it up here. Thank you everybody for joining me today. It was an amazing, amazing day. We had an awesome right here, St. Patrick's Day. And uh, yeah, it's get your green out, wear your green and celebrate with the rest of us in Canada and um, in whatever, in whatever way you feel best, all right? Thanks so much guys, if you need any help, ever, ever need any help. We are immigration lawyers over at Holfi Immigration Law. And when I pull this over here and I flip open the page right here, Holfi Immigration Law, we are immigration lawyers who are here to help you in whatever way you guys need. So if you have questions, if you're uncertain, sometimes that short little consult of 25 minutes can save you hundreds of hours of time trying to sift through websites and online forums and WhatsApp groups that Guys, you know you can't trust that information. Come on over, book a consult, and we can help you. All right, guys. Thanks so much. Take care.